Hi, everybody. Thank you for joining us today for this session. Um, we are just going to give a few minutes for everyone to join the call. Hello and welcome. Thank you so much for joining us um, to learn about Salmon today. We've got some really exciting guest speakers. And yeah, we just really are really grateful for your time um, and giving up your an hour of your evening to talk to us about Salmon. So thank you so much. Um, we're going to share a little bit of boring housekeeping that's very important. Um, so I'll talk you through that just now. Um, you'll notice that you have a toolbar along the bottom of your screen. Um, you'll notice that you can see a box that says Q&A. So if at any point you have questions for the speakers, it would be amazing if you could share these in the Q&A box. Um, please indicate if your question is for a specific speaker um, or if the question is for everybody. You'll also notice that you have a reactions tab, so you can also share things like thumbs up, etc. cetera. Um, and you'll also notice that there's a captions tab as well called CC. So if you click CC, this will just create a live transcript and you can read everything that the speakers are saying. It's actually quite accurate, it's quite good. Um, so if you find that useful, then please do turn it on. And um, if it's not for you, then you can just leave it off. We just ask as well that um, you don't share any links in the chat box. We do have a chat box here, which we would really encourage you to use to share your comments. Um, but please don't share any web links in this. And that is just a safeguarding uh, question around that. So um, please just open only open links from the speakers today. Thank you. So yeah, feel free if you're using the chat box to, to try it out now. Um, if you want to say a quick hi, maybe where you're calling from, that's always quite interesting to, to hear. And we'll get started in another minute or so. And the last thing I'll just say as well is that uh, this webinar is being recorded. So um, if at any point you need to jump off or you want to watch it back later or you want to share it with some people, then look to the Scottish Wildlife Trust's YouTube channel. And the webinar will be uploaded uh, shortly after um, it's, it's been aired. So do keep an eye on that. And you can also watch back the previous webinars we've ran. So this is part of a webinar series and it's number five out of six in the series. Um, and each webinar has profiled a different marine species and the people who are behind the scenes working really hard to protect that species. Um, so do please watch the others back if they interest you as well. Good stuff. So it looks like the attendee numbers are quite stable. Um, so I think we'll just crack on just now. And if anyone does join as we go, then that's absolutely fine. Um, so yeah, just to say again, thank you so much for spending an hour of your afternoon um, with us this afternoon to actually take part in this webinar. Um, it's really exciting that we've got such fantastic guest speakers here, um, people who are working on salmon in Scotland and can share a lot of really great insight as to how they're faring um, in our waters in Scotland. So we'll do a bit of introductions as we go. In the first instance, what we'd love to do is ask you a question. So you're gonna see a poll pop up on your screen. So the question is, which of these do you think represents the greatest threat to salmon? So we're looking for one single thing. It's really hard, I know, because there's so many threats that affect salmon. Um, but what do you think is the greatest in your opinion? So we have everything from water quality and pollution um, to developments, could be things like offshore wind or even bridges and things along rivers, climate change, invasive species, fishing and aquaculture, and also habitat loss as well. So I'll just give it a wee minute because the bars are moving quite fast, which means a lot of people are voting. And thank you to everyone who's introducing yourself in the chat as well. It's always really interesting to see who's on the call. Okay, so it looks like the bars, oh no, they're still moving. Um, I'll give it just another few seconds. So we hope that 
once we show the results of this, this is just your opinions. Um, hopefully by the end of the session today, you might have learned something new. Um, perhaps your answer might have changed. Okay, I'm gonna end the poll there. And you can now see the results on your screen. So it looks like the most popular answer was climate change, interestingly. It's 32% of people, followed by water quality and pollution, um, then development, then fishing and aquaculture, habitat loss and invasive species. Now we know it's really hard to pinpoint just one threat because often it's the cumulative impact of various threats that causes such a problem for our species. Um, but thank you for taking part in that. That was really interesting to see. So in the first instance, what I'd love to do is to introduce you to Mark Bilsby, who is the CEO of the Atlantic Salmon Trust. And I'll hand over to you, Mark. Good evening. Um, thank you very much, Eloise, for the invite. Uh, really delighted to be here. And um, I couldn't vote. Um, so panelists weren't allowed to vote. I think I'd have probably ticked all of them though. I think um, I'd just like to share my screen with you if that's okay. And um, hopefully you can all see that. Hello, I'm Mark Bilsby. I'm CEO of the Atlantic Salmon Trust. And um, for those of us that spend time around rivers, whether it's watching salmon jumping in pools or trying to leap up a waterfall, we've been we've been seeing fewer of them in, in our rivers um, over, over recent years. And it's not just anecdotal information. There, there are genuinely less salmon coming um, back to our shores. And it's not a, just a Scottish problem or a UK problem, but it's a problem around the whole Atlantic. Um, salmon numbers have dropped from about eight to 10 million in the mid 1980s down to about two or three million when they were last, uh, the numbers were last quantified publicly. Um, and it's a decline that's not showing any signs of flattening out. Um, and it's and it's a severely worrying trend. So the first question um, is, why are salmon declining? And uh, it's it's a big question. And it's a big question because of the, the life cycle of salmon. They're one of the few species that spend the first few years of their life, one, two, three, maybe even four years or more, in fresh water, living in the headwaters, growing from the size of an egg, the size of a pea, uh, up to a, a juvenile salmon called a smolt. That's about five, six inches long, and they they then head out to sea um, in the spring, and then become real ocean migrators. Um, the first year they head up to the uh, the coast of Norway, up to a place called the Vering Plateau, where they're in rich feeding waters, along with lots of other species of fish. Um, some spend more than a year at sea and will venture far afield as the west coast of Greenland. So they've got this really complex life cycle, which means answering the question, why are salmon declining? Such a simple question, really complex to answer. And for us, um, when you've got a big problem, try and split it down into lots of smaller problems. So what we're trying to do is take that life cycle of that salmon from the headwaters of the rivers, um, through the main stems, their estuaries, their coastal zones, and then as they go into the open ocean, find out where and why they're dying. And we've called it a, a likely suspects framework. Um, but it's a bit like uh, life insurers when they work out the different risks to people, what's killing the fish and where. Um, and we've been looking at a segment of this, and Eloise has asked me to talk about the Murray Firth Tracking Project. And where the Murray Firth Tracking Project comes in is, is in this part. It's looking at the journey of these young fish, these smolts, as they head down the main stem through the estuaries and out to sea. And we've been using a technique called acoustic tracking. Um, and I'll show you the ingredients for an acoustic tracking project so you can get a good understanding. But first, we took the area and the Murray Firth. And the Murray Firth's really important because it's host to about 20 to 25% of the whole of the UK's wild Atlantic salmon. These are the big rivers, um, not all, but some of the major rivers coming in uh, into, our, into the sea, into the North Sea uh, with the salmon. And over the three years of the project, um, we wanted to understand where are the fish going missing? And we spoke to fishery managers and I see there's a few on the call, 
they'd always say, well, the problem's at sea. Um, you know, we've, we've got this loss of fish at sea. Um, there's, there's nothing we can do about that. And we wanted to check that, we wanted to come in uh, with no preconceived idea. So we wanted to find out where they were going missing. We then wanted in the second year to find out what are the suspects that are responsible? Why are these fish going missing? And then, then in the third year, uh, we lost a year due to COVID. Um, it was to find out what are the mortality drivers? What's driving this mortality? And most importantly, how can we inform managers? How can we better look after these precious few remaining wild Atlantic salmon? So the ingredients, the main ingredients of an acoustic tracking project. Um, first, you need a salmon. You need a young salmon uh, that you can tag with an acoustic tag. And all an acoustic tag does is it puts out a coded ping and it says, I'm number 32. And then in the middle picture, we've got a, a listening station, a receiver that's just listening out for those coded pings as they go past. And we put those either in the riverbeds or out at sea. And they're just waiting, listening for the fish and storing that information on a small hard drive on that receiver. And to give you an idea of scale, it's about the size of a, a two litre bottle of Coca-Cola. At the third and really critical um, element are people whether it's the scientists sort of trained up to a veterinary standard to tag the fish and look after them, or the absolute army of volunteers that have helped us move kit about. They've turned up with tractors to help us get traps into rivers. They've turned up for six, seven weeks, seven days a week to help us tag the fish and follow them out to sea. Um, because we deployed across seven rivers, st starting over in the east, we had the Deveron, then the Spey, the Findhorn, the Ness, the Conan, and the Oikel and the Shin as our freshwater sites where we were tagging these the smolts as they came down these rivers. And then we had a line of receiver, lines of receivers out at sea so we could follow those fish for the first hundred kilometers of their ocean journey. Um, and we quickly found out that it's quite easy to put stuff at sea. Um, you need a strong guy, he's called Bill, um, to put this stuff uh, on, the, on the ocean floor. Um, but it's quite a job to get it out again uh, and to lift it off the seabed and download it because we need to get those receivers back to be able to download. And Bill's like a Canadian Mountie. He always gets his receivers back. Uh, and we, so we've got good information coverage uh, going on in the Murray Firth. And I'm going to give you some of the preliminary results. There's a massive amount of information that we're plowing through at the moment to try and understand what's going on. So it's it's very it's very early days with this analysis. So what did we find in year one? Well, firstly, the receivers work really well. And well, what do I mean by that? Well, about 98%, they're about 98% fit efficient. So if a tagged, a tagged fish went past, these receivers would pick up about 98% of them. So they're very reliable and the system worked well. Overall, we saw that about 50% of our smolts went missing in action as they went down the river. Some rivers, it was much worse. The Ness, it was up to 90%. And uh, we, we had to start looking into that. Why, why are there these differences going on? Um, but when the fish got to sea, it was a relatively safe space for them as they passed through the estuary and out to sea. Um, they didn't show. We were expecting them all to group together, like the photograph behind me, but they didn't show. But they did show a strong directional movement. And the majority of the fish, not all, moved along the southern southern coast of the Murray Firth. And that was against the prevailing current. So they were actively swimming against the current and they weren't heading north. And we do know they have to, in a relatively short space of time, head north um, up to their feeding grounds in Norway. But they weren't taking that most direct route, so they were swimming against the current. So that was our findings in year one. Um, in year two, we wanted to start looking at what, what suspects were responsible with this, what was causing these fish to go missing in action? And I'm trying not to bamboozle you with a whole host of graphs, um, but I've got one, uh, so if you can bear with me. And it's the detection of salmon as they migrate downstream. And what we've seen is a very clear pattern between free flowing rivers, such as the Spey uh, or the Oikel, and those rivers that have got impoundments, such as a weir or canal. Um, so the free flowing the rivers are in blue, and we're seeing a much greater detection of fish going down. 
What's happening with the impounded rivers or where there's these pinch points is we're seeing a sudden drop off around the impoundment of the detection of these smolts as they go through. And that could be for a whole host of reasons. Uh, and we're just in the process of trying to work that out. Um, so what do we think is happening? Well, the key take home messages from uh, the first two years were repeatable trends. If, if you're going to get it's, it's fine getting a pattern in one year, but you need to repeat over several years to find out if the trends that you're getting are real or whether you just tagged fish in an odd year, whether the rivers were too high, too low, it was too hot, it was too cold. You, you need normal. So you can only get normal by doing this over a few years. We, it was starting to appear that if these patterns were correct, that barriers to migration were clearly compromising smolt survival. And there's the, there's the obvious candidates of this is potentially increasing predation on the smolts, where you're getting um, smolts being held back and the predators seeing there's a congregation of prey and, attack, and going in and uh, attacking and eating those fish. Um, and they can be the obvious predators, such as fish eating birds. They, they do exactly what the name suggests, but it can be the less obvious ones as well. It can be other fish. It can be pike. It can be trout. And we really needed to get an under idea of what's going on. We also saw in certain instances where people thought that the weirs would, or the barriers were going to be a problem and were trapping and trucking smolts past this. And at times that was just as bad as the barrier itself. Sometimes they got out really well, sometimes not so well. So we needed to be careful how people were intervening with these fish. These are very delicate animals. So year three, and we started to look, the areas that we were looking, starting to focus in on were these, again, the migration pathways down the river. But we had a greater focus on the predator behaviors. We started doing regular trips down the whole lengths of rivers with mobile receivers in a canoe. Uh, down the likes of the space so that we could pick up any detectors that any tags that went missing in between um, receivers and to find out what had happened to them. But we also started to look at predators and um, what were the trout and the pike doing before, during and after the small run in areas that had barriers on them or areas that didn't have barriers on them. And that works literally being um, taken out of the locks today. Um, there's the team up in the north um, collecting those receivers so they can see how the predators have been behaving. And, and I know you're all about to eat your supper, um, but we also looked at predator-prey interactions because you are what you eat. And um, if you eat something, um, nature takes its full course and there's remains, there's DNA remains of all of the food items um, that the different predators eat in their scats. So we've been analysing scats before, during and after um, the smolt run um, to see where smolts are appearing in scats from the various predators around a catchment and um, to get a better understanding of these predator-prey interactions. So where are we up to now? Um, we're just, as I say, we're just getting some of these receivers out of the water at present. But the areas of focus or these areas of worry for us um, surround sort of three, three key areas. One, is flow. In, in low flows, we see a greater loss of smolts going down the river. You know? And is that as rivers change from losing their snowpack and we're getting less snow melt coming down the rivers? And is it really climate change in action? Um, I think we're seeing that. I live up in Aberdeenshire and we're seeing, although it's snowy today, and we're seeing a lot less snow than we did 10, 20 years ago. And that's having an impact on the flow levels in the rivers that come off areas such as the Cairngorms. Second area is these pinch points, and we typically think of them as man-made barriers, but they can also be gravel bars caused by low flow conditions, and it's allowing those predators to potentially congregate around them uh, and impact on smolt survival. But barriers also operate in a different way, and, and that's if they slow fish up. Uh, even in the absence of predators, if you slow an animal up in its migration, um, then you can um, lessen their chances of successfully making it out to sea. And the third area is management, is human intervention 
intervention, it can be as bad as the different problems that the salmon face. So if we are going to intervene, we need to we need to think once, twice, several times before we actually going intervene in case we do more harm than good. Positive note that I take from what we found in the Murray Firth is a lot of the problems that we're seeing are man-made. And they're being expressed in our rivers because salmon are an incredible indicator of biodiversity. They are that canary in the coal mine for our rivers and oceans. And they're telling us all is not well with our rivers and our seas. And the problems that these salmon are facing are all man-made. The vast majority of them have a human origin of one form or another. And it's really up to us if we want salmon to have a future. It, it's not going to be a random choice where the salmon survive in 20, 30, 50, 100 years time. It's because people like the people on this call will take the action, look after these salmon, remove some of these um, uh, pressures that the salmon are facing, these man-made pressures and give them the choice. And it's really easy to get caught up in the science of this and, and worry to the nth degree about the salmon. But what salmon really need to have a viable future it's just three very simple things. They need cold, clean water. They need cold water. Um, they need to be resilient from the impacts of climate change. That water needs to be clean. It needs to be free from parasites, from disease. It also needs to be free from pollutants, whether it's the obvious, and um, it's in the news a lot at the moment with the Paul Whitehouse series, uh, free of things like sewage, pollution, but also free of those insidious chemicals that we don't see that often, the, the pharmaceuticals that are going into our rivers um, every day and uh, are impacting our fish. And thirdly, it's, um, it's, although it sounds like a no-brainer, salmon need water. Um, we need to um, ensure that they have enough flow, enough natural flow of water going down their rivers, down these rivers, so that they can complete their life cycle. They're big ocean migrators, big river migrators, and they need they need these corridors so that they can migrate down, down them and then back up again. So that's all we need to boil it down to, cold, clean water um, and fish to have access to that. Um, my last but one slide is a massive thank you, um, whether it's to our partners in the Missing Salmon Alliance who help fund the work that you've just seen in partnership with the Atlantic Salmon Trust, provided us with moral support, or the over the 50 organizations, the fishery boards, the trusts, uh, and their volunteers who gave thousands of hours over the last three years to help us deliver this project. We're not finished yet. This is very preliminary work uh, that I've just presented on, but we, we do understand the urgency to get these findings out there so that we can start to make a difference um, for salmon and give them a future. So thank you. Um, there's some much more eloquent um, films on the work that we've been doing on our website at atlanticsalmontrust.org. And please have a look at them and feel free to reach out to us at any stage. Thank you. Thanks very much, Mark. Thank you. That was so interesting. Um, yeah, I really like the reflections at the end. I mean, when you state it so simply and say cold, clean water, and it sounds so simple, but then when you break down each of those elements, there is a lot to consider. So thank you so much. That was really, really interesting. Um, we'll then move on to our second guest speaker, who we're really excited to have on the call today. So we have Dr. Willie Yeomans from the Clyde River Foundation. I wonder if you're there. There we go. Fantastic. So um, Willie Owens is the catchment manager. Over to you, Willie. OK. Is, can everybody see my screen? Is it shared? Not yet. Not yet. Um, OK, sorry. But I'll, I'll let you know when, I can see, when we can see it. Sorry. No worries. There we go. That's it now. OK. Uh, thank you. Good evening, everybody. Um, Mark's talk's fascinating and the scale of it, is a, it's, a, it's a big deal. Uh, I'm about to bring it down, right down to one catchment, although it's quite a big catchment. And I'm, uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to talk a lot about data and evidence. Evidence-based fishery management is what the Clyde Foundation is about a lot of the time. Um, so I'm going to show you some data. I'm going to show you some graphs and some photographs and some empirical evidence for uh, interventions, I think, to make things better for salmon. And I'm also going to demonstrate that if you start with a low enough bar, 
there is no bad news. Um, the Clyde salmon, the return of salmon at the Clyde is one of the great good news stories in the history of freshwater biology. There, I've said it. So strap in, we'll go. Um, just as a piece of background, uh, the Clyde is a big piece of Scotland. It's uh, a big river, covers eight counties. It's a recovering river. It's coming back from centuries of alterations to the bed and the banks and pollution. Um, it also is where the people are. It contains about a third of Scotland's population. And we probably do have uh, the most, uh, probably the most uh, urban Atlantic salmon fishery on the planet. The river was formerly heavily industrialized and it's it's well known worldwide for that. But since the sort of 60s, the river's been pra practically deindustrialized. The estuary cleaned up to allow the, the, the salmon to stray in and um, the river itself has cleaned up. So the background to what I'm about to tell you really is all Scottish freshwater fish communities are less than 10,000 years old. Clyde salmon became extinct about 180 years ago. Uh, and they started to reappear in the estuary and lower tributaries in the 60s as things sort of changed downstream. 1983 was the key year. That was probably the year when the run started, really. Uh, and large numbers of adults were observed. And this article here, um, I'll apologise in advance for the next slide, but this article shows that in 1983, things started to happen, and I know that's out of focus, but it's the best I could do, I'm afraid. So in 1983, migratory fish spawned in the main Clyde for the first time in at least 140 years. And what's interesting about 1983 as well is in my lifetime, there were no salmon at all in the Clyde anywhere. Um, it's an iconic animal round about our way. Uh, the Glasgow coat of arms has three on it, one of them very presciently upside down, uh, as it had been for the last up till recently, about 100 years. And the, the picture you can probably see behind me is a picture from the Herald in 1983 of a fish crossing Blantyre Weir. Now, Blantyre Weir is a fairly iconic uh, location on the Clyde. It's about a third of the way up the main stem to as far as salmon can get. There's large parts of the Clyde which aren't accessible to salmon, but that fish is a long way up. Uh, you'll see a slide in Blant Blantyre Weir in a minute. Um, they started to come back in 83. In 86, there was a conference on Clyde salmon. And since then, the, the rod catch uh, in the west coast of Scotland, the rod catch of salmon has stabilized out. Uh, sorry, west coast of Scotland and the Clyde is a fairly significant salmon fi uh, fishery. The catch has sort of stabilized out about five or six hundred a year. So it's not trivial. Um, we don't see many of the big ones as scientists. We see a lot of the little ones. And uh, these were from the, a site in Kilsyth that we surveyed in 2002, found the first evidence of salmon breeding in North Lanarkshire for 100 odd years as well. The ones on the right are young of the year, or fry as we call them, not plus fish. The ones on the left are uh, par. Uh, the bottom ones are particularly impressive specimen that they'll be off to see shortly, as that will. So we applied ourselves to science, uh, the science to the, to the work we do. Uh, spatial monitor, where are they? So when I pitched up here in 2002, this was effectively uh, the, 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 the electric fishing data that I could find, probably about 170 dots on maps over the, the previous 20 years. And that's not to do with salmon, that's everything. Um, and by that time, we could deduce that they had made it as far as, I think it's about 70 or 80 kilometres. They got up uh, the, the Greif, which is the, the Black Cart and the Greif, which are the, the rivers out in Renfrewshire here, got up to Blantyre Weir on the main stem. And they may well have been over Blantyre Weir and breeding up to Lanark, which is Stone Bars Falls as the limit, the natural limit of uh, salmon on the clay. This is a very old picture of me uh, just showing this is what three of us looked like when we set off on the first of our 20 field seasons that we've, that we've done so far. So everything kind of stems from this. This is what it looks like now. Uh, in the last 20 years, we have surveyed about 1,300 sites, 2,800 occasions. Um, I can assure you it's much more impressive on the ground than it is on that map, but this is everything I'm about to tell you is based on that. And what we found over that time is that salmon's present, the, the red dots on that map, uh, we found them at about 135 sites so far. And it may well have recovered recovered about 30% of its pre-industrial age before they were sort of driven out. And this map is just to show you that the red areas there are areas which are not accessible to salmon. So primarily what I'm going to be talking about from now on are the blue areas here. 
So spatial monitoring is where are they? Temporal monitoring, how are they doing? And this is, if this doesn't make you feel sick just after your tea and what would, this is 18 field seasons of pictures from the same site. Uh, you just go back every year at the same time of year. Uh, this is the Allender, which is within Glasgow City. And we now have about 20, 21 years worth of survey data here. And some of these figures for juvenile densities are absolutely astronomical. The, the, the 404.5 per square metre is a lot of salmon, a lot of juvenile salmon. So um, lots of information on some of these sites. That one within the city of Glasgow, we don't tend to shout about it. But So we have numbers. And this is what... Our, uh, 2015, we sort of looked at every single salmon we caught up to then and measured them all. And this is what an average Clyde salmon looks like. The not plus year of the fry, the young of the year, they thin out quite a lot. Uh, one plus fish are about 10 to 15 centimetres long, and then they basically go to sea. Just a few hangers on for two years in freshwater, three years in freshwater, rather. Um, this is Blantyre Weir. Uh, it's a fairly serious structure. You can see why that would hold salmon up. There is a fish pass there, which for a while we had a fish counter in. We still have the fish counter, we just can't afford to run it, unfortunately. Um, the, that's, I think, the first fish we had coming through it. So we run it for about three years. And what we found out is most salmon tend to come up in August and September. This is just the, the seasonality of the, of the, the fish coming through. And that the run that's passing Blantyre, we're probably somewhere in the region of 1,500 fish, somewhere in that kind of order. Now, the pressures on these fish, it's not all good news, the pressures on these fish take many, many sort of uh, uh, types, and I'll, 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 I'll uh, discuss a little bit of that just at the end, because it's been quite a week already for this. Uh, we have pollution. We have a big river when the thick end of 2 million people live in near it. Weird things happen from time to time. We have non-native species. We have five five populations of uh, signal crayfish, some of which are currently coexisting with salmon. Uh, we've spent a bit of time studying these. We could be doing with been a, little, a little more. Not a good thing. They're sort of chewing their way through our native biodiversity. Um, not quite sure if we can gauge any effect on salmon yet because they haven't really reached them in number. But um, we have barriers. This is a huge weir at Mill Huck on the River Avon. And this slightly ugly structure at the far end is a, 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 a the yellow thing is a fish pass going in and what happens what has happened with that fish pass is that um you can see if you work up the river from the top it, if, it, as you go down the page you're going up river basically that fish pass was where that triangle is there we were aware of salmon below it before the, the fish pass was put in after that the green dots they started to appear in number and the red dots are all the places we haven't found salmon in the Avon catchment. So there's a lot of work to do where they're now being held up by that, by that square. Oh, sorry, I should have said, when we, when we see the fish coming in, when we go looking for them, we take guys from the local angling club. This guy is in his 80s, and secretary of the local angling club. First salmon he'd seen right outside their, uh, their club hut. And it's the furthest upstream record we had of a salmon at that point. They've moved up. The guys from SEPA have moved up a, li a little bit, moved them upstream a little bit since then. But when we, when we were, we're now measuring the, uh, uh, measuring the, the spread of these fish through the Avon catchment, we went to that site well above that barrier that we just saw the fish pass on. It took us 28 seconds to catch the first two salmon. So that's, you know, things can go, if you start with a low enough bar, things can get good very quickly. They're now being held up, I believe, by this structure here, which is uh, uh, near uh, Straven. Um, we've got to be careful with this one. There's a sort of fish pass on it. The SEPA guys have found a couple of par upstream of it. We've never found anything, but they've, they've found them twice in two different years. So we take that seriously. But I think that's a fairly serious blockage and uh, needs to be approached with caution because the Straven raft race takes place behind that every year. And of course, we're not the only users of the river. Another one, another good news story, the Gotter Water, uh, that you can see the little fish pass in the background there, it was built up, we couldn't take the weir away, which of course should always be the first move, get the weir away, get the natural processes returned, but we couldn't do that. Um, the fish were passing up this weir before the shuttering was taken off the, con the, the concrete, which is quite something. This is us in rescuing fish before it was built, so you can see how what a structure it was. It was unequivocally keeping salmon out, that's the first salmon seen upstream of it for a hundred odd years. 
And these are the data. Uh, we monitor a site above that river, uh, above that pass, and we've monitored it since 2003. No salmon until 2019. Six months after the fish pass was opened, the salmon were dominating at that site, and then it tailed off the next year. I suspect because of very low flows, but you can get instant returns on these jobs. This is another one. This is in Kilsyth, where for years and years and years, we, there's a school just out of shot on the left. We've been telling children that these uh, salmon come all the way back from Greenland and they can't get up this, this uh, sort of shoot thing. So put some data to the right people, essentially, and uh, SEPA and the council went to fix it. Oops, sorry. So we have, that's it drained down. That's it with some uh, the, the sort of basic fish pass in. That's us upstream of the fish pass. It's not a staged picture. I was actually looking at that. And that top fish there is the first salmon recorded in the center of Kilsyth in anybody's memory. First juvenile salmon. In fact, first salmon, I would say. Uh, that one fish generated a ministerial visit and a whole lot of PR uh, that we kind of shied away from. Just downstream of that, um, there's a fairly serious uh, river restoration project going on, three or four million quids worth of taking a formerly poker straight channel through a, through a, what's a, some pretty rough land, uh, which has been restored, looks, still looks like a little bit like the surface of the moon. These are my colleagues monitoring the invertebrates uh, last year. We did, we're monitoring this because nobody else is doing it. We're doing it as part of a charitable mission. And so we're paying for this effectively. We electric fished it as well. And we got salmon there. It's not a huge surprise. Brand new channel designed for salmon spawning, salmon spawning it. They used to spawn in the crappy old one, which was next door. But it shows, again, an intervention that works. And a third example, uh, where this is ongoing. The red dots here, if you're moving from top right to bottom left, up river. This is a, in the south side of Glasgow, the Levern and the Brockburn. These two rivers are beautiful little burns. Uh, salmon, we know salmon spawn in the bottom end of the Levern. There's a bit of a, a bit of a, my colleague for scale, a bit of a weir there. We've never caught a salmon above it. And this summer, that's getting taken away. So that's a winner. These are two guys from an angling club where we took out. Now, they're, <laughs> at least the guy on the left's looking pleased with himself. The other, Alex, needs to work on his smile a wee bit. But these are the first salmon recorded at this location on the, the, the Nethan for at least 20 years and probably a good long time before that as well. Uh, we had tried looking for these for four years. <laughs> and that's that's the map there again, top right downstream, all the black dots are where we haven't found some and these red dots are where we have. I'm fully expecting this to, these to spread quite quickly now. Uh, so again, a bit of recovery. Um, we also do a lot of work, you know, we talk to people about this. It's not just data and, and moaning. Uh, we have a lot of school projects where we work with children regularly to talk about the Clyde and its river. So we work with about 80% of the primary schools in the catchment, and there's something like 550 of them. We're, we're right in this just now. I, I, we spent the last three months talking to 10-year-olds, frankly, full-time. So it's quite nice to have some adult company here. Um, we've had about 50,000 children now into rivers or rearing trout with us. So we, we've got big messages to get out there. And again... Uh, uh, this is a project that we did with, with Mark and the AS, yes, uh, the, the Missing Salmon Alliance last year. This is um, um, oh, Salmon Homecoming. No, it isn't. <laughs> so I can't remember what it's called at the moment. Salmon School, sorry. It's a, it's, a long, it's, a, it's a long story. Anyway, if you catch people young enough and you show them things at the right time, they will never forget it. We have three times in my life I've been with school children where we've electrofished a burn right beside their school and been able to say to them, see this fish in this tank, this is a salmon. We are the only people alive who have seen a salmon from that burn. And that's quite a thing to do. It's a very powerful thing for me. Um, if you start with a low enough bar distribution-wise, you can't go wrong, really. You can't fake that. The problems, we were talking about problems. Mark talked about water uh, quality and quantity is a big one. This is a brand new fish pass in Kilsyth that was dewatered by an abstraction last year, further up. Brand new. You can't, you can't have, you can either have one or the other. You, can, you can't have over abstraction and salmon going up there. So we, every time we do this, we have a new set of challenges to deal with. 
This was last, this is actually this week, this is the Brock Burn that I talked about earlier on, completely dewatered by an abstraction upstream. Uh, there's a lot of, lot of stuff going on about that at the minute. With a bit of luck, you'll never have seen this before, despite it being a terrible picture. That's this thing called sewage fungus. That We have salmon spawning 500 metres below that. That's a, a stone wall indicator of chronic organic pollution, and that's happening in one of my spawning burns at the minute, and I'm, we've got work to do there. Uh, now, and th these are uh, quite interesting fish because these are the only salmon I've seen in the last 10 years that have absolutely, definitely, the ones at the bottom are salmon, uh, the one at the bottom is definitely died because the water temperature was too high. Straightforward water was too warm for them. Nothing to do with the oxygen particularly, but pretty bad. They are, uh, that was in a major river. That was in the Black Cart, one of the big tributaries of the Clyde. And if that can heat up like that, we've got a lot of work to do with the smaller ones further up, try and keep them shaded. Uh, we are not sort of uh, passive about what happens in the Clyde. Uh, we are vigilant. This is a skip full of dead salmon that uh, occurred. Uh, these were recovered from the Clyde about 10 years ago from right in the middle of Glasgow and Glasgow Green. Um, these are big, valuable fish. And uh, we lost them because we couldn't keep the oxygen level up high enough in the river. Various reasons for it, but this happens every now and again, and it's not on really. So just to summarise, in 1950, there were no salmon at all in the Clyde catchment. By 1986, they'd occupied that red area and possibly the black area. These are our data that now give us this map. And that is where salmon are found in the Clyde now. It's probably gone up a little bit. The biggest, the biggest um, recent gains have been these two, the, the, the Avon and the Nethan. Um, we have work to do, particularly on that river there, which is the North Calder, and this one here on the South Calder. We are now into marginal gains. We have to spend serious money to get rivers, uh, to get salmon up there. But the people who live at the top of these rivers pay their taxes the same as people who live everywhere else. And I think we've got a job to get that sort of message over as well. Thank you for your attention. Thank you so much, Willie. That was so interesting. Yeah, there's lots of really great reactions that have been happening through that session and at the end as well. Hope you saw those. Um, yeah, thank you so much. Um, for the sake of time, um, we're going to jump to a quick poll question um, and then we're going to head over to Jess for uh, a little bit more information before we move to the Q&A. Um, the poll question we have for you guys, which will make sense once you see what Jess is going to talk about. Um, is which of the following statements comes closest to your view? The term nature-based solutions, NBS, have you heard of it before? So the first one is you've heard of it and you know a lot. Maybe you've heard of it and you know a little, or you've never heard of it. So we'll just give just a wee minute for that to tick over. And all will become clear once we get Jess on the call to give her presentation. Okay, so the bars are slowing down and it looks like they've stopped. So I'm gonna end it there and you can see the results on your screen. So it looks like most people have heard of nature-based solutions and they know a lot, um, but equally it's very close. Uh, some people have said that they, they've heard of it, they know a little, and actually quite a lot of people said that they've never heard of it. So that's really useful to know. Um, so Dr. Jessica Jones is our project manager for the Living Seas Project at the Scottish Wildlife Trust. So over to you, Jess. Thanks very much, Eloise. Um, let me just check, can you see my screen okay? Yes. Okay, brilliant. Um, yeah, so basically just gonna give a little quick overview about kind of general advocacy and policy work um, in Scotland Seas. Um, but the Living Seas team, um, we kind of, our work is uh, separated into two parts. So we have uh, some policy and advocacy work, and then we have an engagement, community engagement side. Um, so I think uh, the previous presenter summarized all of these key threats um, as well, um, but, uh, just to give a brief overview that the uh, key threats uh, to salmon um, that have been 
kind of summarized in various reports are um, poor water quality and changes to water flow, um, barriers to migration, uh, such as weirs, um, and then uh, aquaculture um, can be through sea lice, um, but also escapes through kind of direct competition. Um, habitat loss um, along rivers, especially their kind of uh, gravelly spawning uh, habitat. Um, predation uh, and fishing. Um, but uh, if you want to have a look at for good fishing practice, good sustainable fishing practice, uh, you can look at the Marine Conservation Society's Good Fish Guide. Um, I'm not going to go over most of the fishing um, anymore, but we do actually have a policy on aquaculture and we also have a policy on fisheries management on our Living Seas website if you do want more of our advocacy work um, on that kind of area. Um, obviously, the, the rising sea temperatures and climate change does have an effect um, on these species. Um, and as we've highlighted earlier, they do really like cold water. Um, and invasive non-native uh, species. Um, I think Willie actually um, summarized some with the crayfish, um, but also invasive species in terms of plants uh, along the side of the river bed, uh, as long the side of the river. Um, so what can we do about this? Oh, I change. There we go. Uh, we need an ecosystem-based uh, approach that addresses all of these threats simultaneously. Um, so basically the best way to tackle these is to do a kind of landscape level um, and uh, lots of restoration projects uh, achieve this. So um, nature-based solutions, uh, they are actions uh, that protect, sustainably manage and restore natural and modified ecosystems. Um, and they address societal challenges effectively, such as uh, flooding, um, and they simultaneously provide human well-being. Um, so obviously, being outdoors and in nature does have well-being um, effects for humans as well, but also biodiversity benefits. Um, and these are some of the examples that we actually have of some nature-based solutions. Uh, so things like green walls and roofs can use uh, kind of space in urban areas, but also provide um, important habitats for various species, uh, whilst also having human well-being benefits as well for green spaces. Um, so the nature-based solution that kind of directly applies to, to salmon in general is a uh, riparian woodland restoration. Um, and this is woodland along rivers and watercourses. Um, so the Scottish Wildlife Trust actually had a Help Nature Help Us campaign. Um, and if you go onto our website, then it gives you a list of um, things that you can do to kind of advocate for um, restoration projects and nature-based solution projects um, that would kind of enhance the marine environment, um, improve biodiversity, um, help tackle climate change. Um, and we've got a series of posters that you can download um, and things that you can do in terms of social media. Um, so riparian woodlands in themselves obviously help regulate the the river's temperature, which also benefits species such as sea trout, but also benefits salmon, freshwater pearl mussels. Um, and it also improves water quality. Um, and this also has benefits for um, habitats downstream, such as salt marsh and seagrass, which really require high water quality um, to um, flourish. Um, so within Scottish Wildlife Trust, we actually have Riparian Woodland Restoration Project, uh, which is the Riverwoods Initiative. Um, so it was launched in 2019 um, and aims to create a network of thriving riverbound woodlands and healthy river systems across the whole of Scotland. Um, so really watch this space, uh, subscribe to the Scottish Wildlife Trust uh, newsletters if you'd like to. Um, and we'll kind of be putting out a lot of information about um, how what the Riverwoods Initiative is doing um, in the near future. Um, but yes, this is one of the riparian woodland uh, restoration projects that is ongoing um, within the Scottish Wildlife Trust at the moment. Um, other things that you can do in terms of uh, advert, in terms of uh, kind of where you can go to see salmon. Uh, we actually have a lock of the lows, um, one of our reserves, 
Um, and if you go over in autumn, there is a bridge uh, over the River Tay, um, and you might potentially be able to spot some salmon um, whilst you're having a look around the nature reserve. Um, and there is a really nice visitor center over there. Um, so that's a potential um, for some nice autumn activities. Um, other ways that you can get involved uh, is to join us on the um, Sea Scotland conference. Um, the theme of the conference is actually um, fitting with Atlantic salmon because it's from land to sea. Um, so it's going to be looking at a lot of policy, um, but we're going to take it from the river just out into the ocean um, and it's uh, going to be really great. So I think the tickets are coming out soon and watch this space. Um, but there also is a pre-conference youth event um, in April. Um, and I think we're having all of the links shared in the chat anyway. If anybody is interested, um, you can sign up to their updates. Um, just a little plug at the end of this. Um, if you've missed any of our webinars so far, then they are now available on YouTube um, in a little playlist. Um, so don't worry if you've missed any of the um, ones at the moment. Um, coming up, we have Marie Mowles uh, on Tuesday the 14th. Uh, it's kind of uh, timely because I think on Sunday there's the Wild Isles starting. Uh, and in the first episode, they're actually going to be talking about orca. Um, so you can get a little bit of information in the introduction in that documentary and then follow it up with uh, some marine mammal um, webinar chat um, on the Tuesday afterwards. So. Thank you very much, everybody, for listening to all of the presenters today. Um, and we'll start with the Q&A session now. Thank you, Jess. That was brilliant. Um, yeah, so let's just dive straight into the Q&A. Um, I've just chucked a, a link in the chat box, actually. Um, the Sea Scotland Conference, Jess mentioned, the tickets go on sale this week. They go on sale on Wednesday. Um, it should be Wednesday, so um, keep an eye on Eventbrite for that. But yeah, I wonder if we can invite our speakers to pop your cameras back on and we can work our way through some of the questions that have came in. Thank you so much to everyone who has been listening in and has shared reactions and has shared questions as well. Um, so let's have a look at the first question here. So we have a question from Andrew and this one is, it looks like it's from Mark. So you talked a bit about snowfall and precipitation. Um, so is there a correlation between winter snowfall levels in the highlands or participation in the lowlands compared to levels of smolt runs over the years since we've started seeing drier winters and lower rainfall in the spring months? Um, enormously lowering flows, question mark. Um, I think you may have just answered that, but is it possible to correlate past precipitation with reducing smoke runs? Do you have any comments, Mark? Um, there's a common sense version, which I live in Aberdeenshire on the D. In 1976, the D stopped being a snow-fed uh, river and became a rainfall-fed river, where the majority of the water came from rain instead of snow because of climate change, and, and it's that's increased. We haven't done the analysis yet, um, but we will be doing it uh, in the future. Um, so we can give a scientific answer uh, to, to the work we're doing, but we're going in with an open mind. Sure. Thank you, Mark. Um, we have a question here, which is our next popular question from Johnny. And um, this might be for perhaps both of you or everybody, I'd say everybody actually. Um, what are the difficulties involved in removing barriers altogether rather than constructing a fish pass, which may not be as effective? Who would like to start with that question? Well, I've had some experience of this, although I'm not an engineer, I'm very much a biologist. And uh, we started on the Clyde a while ago to sort of trying thinking we could take away rather because we have dozens if not hundreds of these redundant structures uh, the trouble is there's, there are issues right from the start with ownership you have to find out who owns these things and who admit to owning them uh, this is something that SEPA deals with routinely actually and does quite well I think um, but the, the one that always gets me is that the, there's a uh, in a, in a river, a river is just a conveyor belt of water and sediment of one form, it's one size or another. If you if you put something into that, you're going to alter the flow of both. Um, and it may have been like that for, say, 200 years in some of our places where there's a whole community uh, being constructed round about them. 
strange things start to happen if you knock holes in these to river banks and all sorts of things. Um, and I think if you if you are responsible for some of that, there are all sorts of weird liabilities come with them. And I know that uh, a fish pass isn't a soft option. Uh, it sometimes seems like it. We, we've the one I showed you on the on the Avon. Uh, there was actually a petition put together by local people to take it away, take the fish pass away, because it ruined one of their beauty spots. Uh, now it doesn't matter how well you think how well you think you're acting or what, what it is. You, you really do need to speak to the people around about you. So there's there's that there's the societal side of it. There's also the hard cash side of it. Uh, another structure on the Avon that we had to deal with was a couple of hundred metres below a 100 plus year old viaduct on the West Coast Mainline Railway. And I think taking that weir away could potentially have had all sorts of knock on effects for scour and various things like that. So it's not always so easy on a small scale. Uh, the ones I showed earlier on, they tend to be doing something like protecting a gas main or something like that. <laughs> so you got to be really careful in urban areas where you don't just send a guy in with a digger and get stuck into them. You know, there's there's hassle in some of them. Needs a lot of surveying and and uh, you know, I think Is people that... do the best they can. Yeah, it sounds like it might lend itself to Mark's point where human intervention can be just as bad as the problem some, in some cases. Um, it can cause other problems and exacerbate things. So, yeah. Um, I don't know, Mark, you have any comments on that question? Um, I, uh, people, they change. And um, if they've always seen a structure, it's been part of their landscape, you know, where it, um, they, they fear change. And so, so you need to take people with you and talk about um, the biodiversity benefits that are going to accrue by addressing the issue. Um, I put that as the first problem. The second is each of these ways is surrounded by a sea of paperwork and um, trying trying to um, get through that paperwork to answer all the questions, find out where the gas mains are is, is a soul destroying um, enterprise. But it's what we need to do. And it's, we need to overcome this apathy and we need to be able to align all of the policies to, to look at the societal gains that will happen. If we have salmon right throughout places like the Clyde, you know, how that's enriching people, the community's lives there. So those kids that had that fish pass going on on their school, um, my, my kids would have loved that. They, they, they'd just be blown away by that, knowing that the salmon coming up to their areas. And, and why should we prevent them from their, that cultural heritage? So we, we do need to overcome this apathy and, and um, get them out, get, get, them, get, get those ob obstacles out and not be scared to do it. Well said, Mark. Absolutely. Um, the next comment we have just now is from Susan, and it's to what extent might rising water temperature correlate with reduced depth and flow? Um, does anyone have any thoughts on that? Um, well, if it's hotter, um, we're, we're seeing um, predictions for lower summer flows, so 18% lower summer flows in certain areas. Uh, and when the flows do occur, they it's it, it rains much more intensely over a short period of time. So you go from having a drought to having a flood and then back to having a drought. And we need to be thinking about how we can look after the rivers to restore those landscapes so they can hold water. So they take the edge off floods and slowly release that water back through, whether it's through peatland restoration or woodland creation through the likes of river woods and um, be able to sort of manage that landscape so it's not just a hard landscape water can permeate down easily you know we can offset this we can offset we, we can make our catchments much more climate resilient and again it, it's having that will to do it that's really vital yeah it sounds like you know what we talk about when we say things like an ecosystem based approach yeah. to conservation where we look at the the system holistically um and how how it interacts we're not just looking at you know for example um you know one area of land or a um, strip of forest or a catchment or river it's it's scaling it up and up and up and thinking about the the connectivity between that um 
on the last question we'll have here just for the oh we're, we're just a minute over so thank you for everyone who's hung on the call for the last question um the question's from martin it says which parasites does mark see as being a problem for salmon in the moray firth and there's brackets in there saying water clean of parasites so i'm guessing that means in healthy river systems but it's it's not just the murray firth it's everywhere that salmon roam and um, salmon aren't really good at boundaries they they they're right across the atlantic and anywhere it shouldn't really be more than 20 30 miles away from a salmon if we had a good environment from a salmon in the uk uh, anywhere in the uk we should be within that sort of distance um so what do i think what do i think of the parasites um Jessica's already mentioned sea lice there's a couple of species of sea lice um, that that are present there which cause issues um but there's also different it gets a bit nerdy, but there's different worms called things like anasarcus, which causes a red vent and irritates the back end of the fish, which is difficult. And then, then there's some more ones that are associated with human activities, such as there's one called a worm called Diflu bothrum, uh, which Willie will know much more about, um, where seagulls are an intermediate host and parasitize fish. And the seagulls become a problem when we don't um, cover landfill sites. So if you have a river near a landfill site, not only is it getting the leachate from that landfill site if it's not well run, but you're also getting lots of seagull poo and that's got this parasite in it, which can harm fish. But Willie's a parasitologist, so he can answer that one probably much better than I can. Thanks for that. <laughs> <laughs> I did my honours project on two species of Diphilobothrium 30 odd years ago. It's been a while since. I, I, I don't know too much about the current state of things. I, I would have thought they would have needed quite slow water and uh, cyclopoids and things. That are, I mean, they're much more common in, in lochs, very common in lochs. But uh, yeah, I'm, not, I'm, I'm really not sure about that. I don't know. Thanks very much for um, for that. That's, that's great to know. I think, um, you know, I think what's clear is that you know, we've only had an hour for this session and it was just a little bit of a, a brief overview um, of, you know, how salmon are faring um, in Scotland. And, you know, we could talk on this for hours and hours. Um, so, yeah, just to say thank you so much to everyone who's taken part and listened and hopefully learned something. Um, and a huge big thank you to all our speakers, um, to Mark, to Willie, to Jessica. Um, really, really appreciate you sharing your time and expertise. If anyone does have any further questions, feel free to send them to our Living Seas email address um, and we can always try and follow up on those to send you some further reading so I'll just add that to the chat box just now but otherwise thank you very much and um, we do have one more webinar in the series which is next Tuesday it's on marine mammals so we'd love to see you there and um, but otherwise have a lovely evening take care and speak soon thank you so I'm just going to end the recording just now <laughs>